morning, everybody. All right, a couple of housekeeping things I want to get out of the way first. Number one, I come from a very Pentecostal and Baptist background, so you guys don't have to be silent in the middle of service. If you want to shout amen, hallelujah, shout, anything like that, perfectly fine. So, if you were following along in your Bible, you wouldn't have seen the word agape there. You would have saw the word love there. The reason why I chose to replace that word, because in Greek, the word there is agape, and it means something drastically different than the word love that you see in your Bible. It's not the same love you have for a Hershey bar or your spouse or for your car or anything like that. In the Bible, you'll actually see four loves. One is called eros, that's romantic love, one you got for your partner, um, somebody who you trying kind of into, you dating, you courting, stuff like that. Next, you'll see storage. Storage is familial love. That's the one for somebody you marry, your kids, your grandparents, stuff like that, right? Then there's phileo. Phileo is a brotherly or sisterly love from friendship. So someone who's like found family, that group of people who you know you can count on at all times. And then there's the one that every time Mark gets up here, he seems to preach about, which is funny because we did not plan this this way. Uh, he was talking about divine love last week, and that's agape. Now, you can see what agape is if you read the Gospels, but luckily, and one of the beautiful things about having a Bible is that Paul tends to summarize a good chunk of the pieces that you see in your Gospels. And if you turn with me, if you've got a Bible with you, to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, if you don't, uh, trust me, I'm going to read it. It's going to be really quick. Uh, I can actually tell you what love is and what love isn't from the agape standpoint. So again, I'm going to replace the word love with agape where this is, but starting at the fourth verse, and I'll break it down as I go. Agape suffers long and is kind, meaning that I'm going to be patient with you. I am going to when you're going through, when you're acting out of pocket, when you're trying to get mad and angry and everything, I'm still going to stay calm, and I'm going to remain kind to you. Agape does not envy. I don't want what you want. Matter of fact, it's going to be the exact opposite. I'm going to cheer on what you have. Agape does not parade itself around and is not puffed up, meaning I'm not going to walk around talking about all the degrees I got, all the Emmys I got, all the writing accomplishments I got, or anything like that. Instead, I'm going to try and remain humble because I'm not trying to put you in a space where you feel uncomfortable to have a conversation with me, right? Agape does not behave rudely. I am not going to point out your flaws, your untucked shirt, your wrinkled clothes, your this, your that, or anything like that. I'm going to remain, again, kind. Here goes the kicker. Agape does not seek its own, meaning, and Jesus actually gives a bunch of examples of this that we can go into at a different date. You put yourself last and everybody else first. Agape is not provoked and thinks no evil. So you can't push agape to snap at somebody. You can't push agape to all of a sudden get angry, get mad, get out of pocket or anything like that does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. I'm not going to point out every little thing that you're doing wrong that may be against what God says in the Bible or anything like that. That's not my job. It's above my pay grade. Instead, I'm going to rejoice in the truth. Everything that he changed and worked on in me where I'm jacked up and flawed, he can also do in you. Agape is going to bear all your pain, all your hurt, all your issues, all your everything. It's going to believe that you can actually get better and believe in all those things. And it's going to hope for Jesus to go ahead and move in you and make a change in your life. And then lastly, it's going to endure with you until that change happens. That's why agape never fails. So if we go back to the verse that was here earlier, that's actually a drastically different thing than most of us think about when we hear this verse. He's not asking you to just be like, man, I love you. He's talking about you doing, you suffering long and kind, just like he did when he went to the cross and still said, forgive them for they know not what they do. He's telling you to not envy because there was never a time where Jesus put himself above everybody else. Matter of fact, he always put himself at the bottom of the list. 
He's telling you to not parade yourself around or puff yourself up. Jesus famously said, who is good but our Father in heaven? He's telling you not to behave rudely. I can remember, if I remember the story properly, he took a whooping for all of us without a mumbling word. He's telling you to not seek your own, put yourself last, just like he put us last and buried everything on his back. He's telling you to think no evil and help each other, and focus on helping everyone just like he helped us. He's telling you to not rejoice in someone's iniquity, just like my favorite verse says, he didn't come to condemn the world, but instead rejoice in their truth that you may, that you may be saved. He's telling you to bear all things just like he bore our sins, believe all things just like he believed we would get it right, and hope all things just like he hoped in our future. And lastly, he's telling you to endure all things just like he endured all our transgressions to the end. And that's why agape never fails. Now, I got a question for everybody in this room. How much different would the world be if just a fraction of the people who call themselves Christians love like that? Right? There'd be less war. There'd be less hate. There'd be less pain. There'd be less poverty. There'd just be less. Many of you, because I've talked to a ton of you guys in three months of coming back and seeing all you awesome people, come from church hurt, from situations where this key thing, this new commandment, the person who we named the religion after said, this is the only new rule I'm giving to you, and they didn't do it. For example, one of the members in this room has shared with me a story where he was using his gift in church. And a guest preacher came and a guest preacher told him, don't do that no more. That's, only things, that's a thing only girls do. Now that alone would be bad enough, like that's lack of agape in and of its own right. But then, the people who sit in the pews, just like you guys are sitting in the pews amongst each other, just like you guys cover each other, not one of them came to his defense. Now, let's put that through an agape framework. What if somebody has suffered long and been kind with him and said, you know what, he was wrong, keep performing your gift and then didn't rejoice in the iniquity of the situation and keep silent, but instead rejoiced in the truth and confronted that pastor who said that. That person's life would have been completely different and that transgression would have been broken. That hurt would have been eliminated. But see, if we again go back to that scripture, one of the things that I really want to point out this part is that it's a transactional statement meaning that the positive of that statement and the negative of that statement are true at the exact same time. It says, agape others the way I have agape you. That's how they'll know you're one of mine. Check that real quick. That means the way that, he know, that anybody can claim to be a Christian is if they are attempting to agape somebody like he agape us. Here goes the inverse of that transaction, sadly. If you're not agapeing somebody, you can't call yourself a Christian. That is the root of almost every person in this room's church hurt. Is someone forgetting that one defining commandment, that one defining concept, being in a place of community with people who claim to be Christians, but clearly were not. Because instead of agape, they chose not to. Now, I don't, one of the things that one of my favorite mentors told me is no one cares about how much you know until they know how much you care. So you can't come to me talking about Jesus if I don't see any agape in you. You can't come around and talk about you're going to go to heaven or go to hell and I don't hear any agape in your voice. You can't tell me that my, your lifestyle is wrong or your lifestyle is wrong or what you're doing is wrong or what you're doing is bad if I don't see any agape in you because agape would have kept your mouth shut. <laughs> right. 
Now, one of the things I want to congratulate this church on is I've seen glimpses of agape already in this house. Y'all deserve a pat on the back and, and some cheerleading and all that good stuff. That's one of the reasons my family and I keep coming back, especially amongst many of the leadership in this church. We've seen agape show up in some capacity. From Andrea enthusiastically welcoming every single person who comes into this place. I mean, that woman is a cheerleader, okay? <laughs> oh. To Kathy putting her work into making sure that we color in all of those pictures for the cancer kids. By the way, in the narthex, make sure you go out and you color out those things. Kathy, I got you, because that's just powerful right there. Or her work on the back to school drive, just helping kids in need get school supplies. Those are elements of agape. But now, and if I ever am invited back to preach here, y'all will learn this real quick. I'm going to challenge you in the same lesson that I'm going to be teaching where I'm praising you. A uh, question for everybody in here. How often are you actually doing that outside these four walls? How often are you putting in that same level of agape work that you can easily do amongst brothers and sisters in Christ because you know we're all working towards the same goal. How often are you going outside of these four walls and just feeding somebody just because they're homeless or helping someone move just because of the, not, not because they're the offer of pizza at the end. Don't get me wrong, pizza's delicious. Trust me and believe. But not because pizza being offered, but just because to help them and care for them. One of you went and volunteered for something bigger than yourself just to help. Now I hear what well, I hear every single time I deliver a message like this, but wait, how am I supposed to love like this all the time? This is hard. I don't get it. It don't make no sense. And guess what? I'm about to give you guys a secret cheat code here. Listen real closely, real closely. You're not going to, and that's okay. That was the point of him going to the cross. So that we had grace and mercy, room to get a little better each day. Don't believe me? Let's look at the Apostle Paul. He wrote 13 books of the Bible. He planted 14 churches. Now, I don't know about y'all. I, I don't have one piece of writing that's considered canon Bible. <laughs> I've maybe planted one church. That's a question mark, okay? And... Yeah, so therefore, he's done more for the cause of Christ, at least than me. I don't know about the rest of y'all. Y'all might be holy rolling, doing some awesome stuff, but at least me, he did a lot more than me. So I'm always reminded of two statements that he gives that reminds me that this is not a game of accomplishments, but it's a game of progress. The first comes from Philippians where he says, I have not already perfected nor already attained but I press on to the mark of the high calling that is Christ Jesus. Meaning that I don't have it exactly right. I don't get this thing perfect every single time, but every day I get up, I try and be a little bit more like Jesus. The second one comes from Romans, and this one hits deep, okay? This one should make everybody be like, I might not be as good as I think I am, okay? The good that I will to do that I don't do. The evil that I will not to do, that I do. This man planted, 13, or planted 14 churches, wrote 13 books of the Bible. You mean to tell me he's still on the struggle bus? That tells me that I should just expect some struggle. It's okay to struggle. That's what grace and mercy is for. Someone at your work is going to forget to print that report you need before you go into that meeting. You're going to get mad. Someone at your, school, at your kid's school is going to look at your kid the wrong way, and you're going to want to snap off just like a black mama. I know my wife do it on a regular basis. Okay? One day, your spouse is going to forget to wash the dishes, and I, I just fear for them they should duck and hide. Okay? You're going to get mad. And that's okay. 
My question to you is, are you going to get up the next day and try and do it differently the next time? Try and, you know what? They might be having an off day. They forgot that report. I'll double check with them before the meeting and in case I'll print the report. You know what? I don't know what's going on in their mind. My kid probably didn't do nothing to them, but hey, you know what? Maybe my kid was a snot. That's okay too. That happens sometimes, okay? So I'm gonna give them a little grace. You know what? He or she may have had a long day at work and so they forgot to wash them dishes. It's okay, but I'm gonna remind them in the morning. <laughs> the point of the matter is, are you going to try and be better each and every day? Again, this is a game of progress, not accomplishments. God is not keeping a tally of how many souls you saved or how many times you were good or how many times you did this, A, B, C, D, E, F, or G. Jesus said he came and he completed the entire law. It was fulfilled. So there is not some checklist that God is going through being like, all right, he did this and he did this, but he didn't do this part right here. He didn't do this right here. Jesus only left him for four basic rules, y'all. Love God with all you got. Love others more than yourself while you're still learning who I am. Once you know who I am, love others the way I loved you. That's how they'll know you're one of mine. And then lastly, when you can do all of that, stress, you can do all of that, then go tell them about me. Not before, because before you're gonna have problems. I'll teach that another time. <laughs> so understand that that struggle is okay. You're going to have problems sometimes. You're going to have struggles sometimes. You're going to not have the perfectly awesome, always on kind of day. But the question is, do you try and agape anyway? And if you can't do it that day, do you try and do it the next day? So as I close and go to my seat, because I've been talking a little bit too long, I got four challenges for everybody in this room, four. Some of y'all get a couple of them because you serve in church leadership. Guess what? There's more weight on us than other people, okay? For those working in any form of church leadership, don't lose your agape. It can cause irreparable harm. For those of you who have been hurt by someone who wasn't showing you agape, make it an effort to double down on that in your life so that the same hurt doesn't happen to someone else. For those of you who struggle to agape, I implore you to learn how. I'm here most Sundays, so y'all can just ask questions if you need to. But hey, you got a bunch of really good examples. Just watch Andrea and duplicate, okay? <laughs> and lastly, for the entire congregation, let's try and agape outside these walls. Mark chronically tells you guys that let your light shine that inner light on the inside. The inner light is that agape, that's what it is. He's referencing the light on the city on a hill and the salt that doesn't lose its flavor, right? Your salt loses its flavor if you're calling yourself a Christian when you don't agape. That's it, that's all. That's all that verse is saying. Please don't read extra into it. It will just hurt your brain and it's not honestly beneficial because most people just translate that wrong. So again, your salt loses its flavor if you don't agape. So. Let's go out and actually be something in the world. Let's make this world change that we want to see. Let's actually put some good into the world. Let's not confine it to these four walls, but let's take this as a challenge to go outside these four walls, show them who Jesus really is, so the people who call themselves Christians, who get the majority of the airtime, who get the majority of all the conversation of evangelical Christian voters get shut up and shut down and actually see what God means in our lives. Because one of the things we need to do, one of the only ways we can take that title back is going outside of these walls and showing that same love you guys show inside these four walls. Amen? Amen. Amen.